Today we're going to be considering various issues in terms of the idea of justice. Um, so overall, as you know, um, our current unit has been concerned with what is the right thing to do in a particular situation. Um, and for your do now, we cover this question of justifiable defenses for murder. So if you would, go ahead and turn to the person next to you and go and discuss your answer to this question. Take about 30 seconds, go. Because other people really can't control how they feel and they can force those, like, those strong emotions and then like, try to find reasons that aren't really good reasons to start learning. So what did you discuss in your group conversation about whether insanity or strong emotion is a justifiable defense for murder? I said I don't think strong emotion is justifiable defense for murder because just because you're mad at someone doesn't mean you kill them because then there'd be a bunch of murders and people say, whoa, I was really mad at this person. But I think insanity is because if you're like, if you're mentally unstable or something, and like even though you can treat that with medication, not everyone does. So they, even though I think that is just follow defense, but they should still, yeah, go to like an asylum or something and still like pay for their crimes, but just not like in prison or something that'll like mess them up more. They should get treated for it, and then when they're better, maybe be let out of the asylum. For today, the story that we'll be covering deals with this idea of character um, and also the uh, scenario of murder. So if you would, um, go ahead and open up your iPads to today's student folder. In there, you'll find two documents. Uh, one is the text of the story, and the second one is the worksheet itself. Go ahead and just copy the objective from the board onto that box below. So the overall objective today is to think about how can understanding character help us make an argument about the nature of justice in the story Lamb to the Slaughter. This lesson relates to a larger unit overall on the idea of justice uh, in which we tackled some larger issues about what is the right thing to do in particular situations and how do we figure out what that right thing to do is. Further, if you'll scroll down below, you'll find there's a section on vocabulary. There are three major terms that we'll be going over today. So the first one is placid. And can someone just read the sample sentence for us, please? The ocean seemed calm, and you said placid or placid? Placid. The ocean seemed calm and placid on the surface, but we knew that dangerous currents were running on it. Now turn to the person next to you. What do you What's your best guess for what the word placid means? Go ahead and talk to them now. Go. I think it means like settled. Yeah, I think it means maybe like dormant or like underlying. In choosing a text, I also thought about the lexile level, whether the vocabulary, whether the rigor of the text was appropriate for 10th grade students. Further, I, I thought about the kinds of discussions that we would be having around this text. So we're going to go ahead and start it off. Uh, can I get a volunteer to begin for us? During this, I'm going to be pausing every once in a while to ask some questions as we go. So be prepared to answer some questions here. And we'll also be going pretty deep into the individual words. Finally, have your other worksheet handy so you can just swipe back and forth between them. The room was warm and clean, the curtains drawn, the two table lamps alight hers, and the ones by the empty chair opposite. I'd like you just to think about these first couple of paragraphs and think about what kind of person does Mary Maloney seem to be based on these first few paragraphs. Uh, think about it for about 10 seconds. Look for specific clues in the paragraph. She's like a stay-at-home mom, basically, yeah. except without children. Well, she's yeah, on her way. Yeah. She's a homemaker. She's a homemaker? Yeah. Yeah, she's really nice. Uh, so what did your group discuss? What kind of person does Mary Maloney seem to be? Well, when our group read it, we thought that she was like a happy newlywed and she was excited that she was pregnant and she was married and then she just was waiting for her husband to come home, but she wasn't like, oh my gosh, I wish she would come home. She just was excited because each minute that went by was like he was going to be home closer, I guess. Uh, with that knowledge now, I want us to revisit that first paragraph because there seems to be like some kind of weird stuff going on here. Uh, so remember, we're going to be really closely reading like why did the author choose these specific details. Um, so if you would, just read along with me as I read this first paragraph. 
It says, the room was warm and clean, the curtains drawn, the two table lamps alight, hers and the one by the empty chair opposite. On the sideboard behind her, two tall glasses, soda water, whiskey, fresh ice cubes in the thermos bucket. So thinking about that paragraph, now that we know more about Mary Maloney's character, how does this paragraph help sort of set that up a little bit more? So usually we know who the pronoun is about. So what is unusual about this pronoun? Nathan? She says hers and his, and we know she's talking about the um, husband, but we don't know who the husband is yet. Great, she, nor do we know what, in the, just in this first paragraph. Uh, like, I mean, we know her name, but we don't know who she is. Like, Do we know her name in this first paragraph? No. Oh, no, we don't. Yeah, so this is actually really weird. Um, so the author has made a conscious choice to use the pronoun her um, without actually telling us who her is. So why did the author do this? So normally in a story, it would say the person's name first and then refer to her as her. In this story, it just has this random her that we don't know about and then it tells us her name later. Like, what effect does that have on the reader and why did the author do that? Maybe they did it so it could draw you in more and make you want to keep going and reading. Um, maybe because it's trying to say because she was waiting for her husband so an anxiously that she kind of forgot to say her own name. Yeah. Um, and I, I like this interpretation a lot. It's like um, she's forgetting about herself, as Autumn is saying. It's not really about her. She's sort of living for her husband. So this is sort of an instance where you see like a really small thing that an author does. Like he, he does not write the person's name and instead uses the word her. But in doing this, he makes an even broader point about what this character is all about. Um, she's sort of all about living for her husband. Um, therefore, it would make sense that we don't even know her name in the first place. Common Core really pushes the level of thinking that our students are on. Just in terms of my own practice, since the beginning of Common Core, I've been much more conscious in terms of trying to really get students to think on a higher level than they have before. Uh, we're not just going to talk in our groups about this relationship between Mary and the husband. Um, specifically, um, you can answer these two questions about their characteristics, but also talk about what details from the story show uh, the nature of their relationship with one another. He seems like off today because she said it was Thursday and how they usually go out, but today he's just like drinking a like, cup of whiskey after whiskey and just seems like He's angry or aggravated about something, but he's just not talking. He just seems really cold to her and like not appreciative of what she does. Yeah. Like he's like, oh, do you want this? Oh, I could get you this. And he's like, no, I don't want that, no. And he just gets up and gets his like alcohol and just deals with that instead of her. To me, it seems like he's just, he's not himself like everybody else has said, but it also seems like he's kind of hiding something. Like he has something to tell her, but he doesn't want to. That Mary is okay, patiently waiting for her husband to come home and all to achieve this by showing her repeatedly looking at the clock and having everything ready in the house clean for him. And I said Patrick is an experienced cop who had a rough day and does not want to be bothered. And he shows this by him drinking all the him drinking a whole cup of alcohol and giving his wife blunt answers. Yeah. I wanna focus in particular on just the nature of this dialogue. Take a look at how the sentences are written um, when he is speaking. So are there any patterns or any characteristics about what the sentences look like when the husband is talking? So his sentences are kind of short and it always says like he said what is her, like she is like she cried or she went on. Whereas him it's just like really short and he's just saying it like really abrupt. So Taylor makes a really strong point here. Um, with two things, with these some snacks actually. Um, first of all, uh, the sentences are really short. So, uh, what kind of emotion might this show if just the sentences are really short? Sabrina, um, it can show the type of emotion of annoyed. Like he's annoyed by her. Like he doesn't want to be bothered with her. Great. And then the fact that all of the things that he says are just introduced with he said. So if you would go through this page, 
underline every time it talk, he talks, and notice that it just says, he said, he said, he said. And then just notice whenever she speaks, what are some examples of ways that the quotations are introduced when she speaks? Generally, doing this kind of close reading is more difficult uh, because you're often asking students to do things that they haven't been asked to do before. In order to really approach the rigor of the Common Core, it's not just sort of about understanding the author's meaning at words, like comprehending the text, but going even deeper into seeing the way that the author creates that meaning. Um, so in the previous two paragraphs, we have an indication that a couple of clues that something is important here. Um, what are these clues that we know something is important? Because when it's written in the story, it just says, she, she looked it out and looked at it. It was wrapped in paper, so she took out the paper and looked at it again. And it says, oh, like a lamb. It's in its own sentence, away, and not in the rest of the paragraphs. It's just there by itself. So you know it's going to be important because it's singled out. Uh, so remember that we're thinking about the, the author's craft here. So it's not just about the story itself, but the way that the author writes it. And the author really explicitly is sort of yelling at you, this is important, because it's like one short individual paragraph of a sentence. Um, another clue that this is important is what? I think another clue that uh, is important is the way that she was holding it, because she was holding it by the thin end with both of her hands. And if she was bringing it up for dinner, she would have been like really holding it and taking it upstairs and not really holding it as if to hit something or swing it. Great. And then thinking about the title, can someone make a comment here? It's a layer to the slaughter, so it's kind of like slaughter, like kill, whatever. And it's a leg of lamb, so maybe she's going to kill him with the leg of lamb. So mm. important points to just be thinking about here. Like whenever the, a word or a part of the title uh, appears in the story, like indicated that something is going on. The students that I have are generally on a career and technical track, and so not all of them uh, came in with the goal of wanting to go to college or pursuing higher education, but we just wanted to make sure that in uh, the lessons that we teach and the academics that we do at the school, um, we are able to leave them with options at the end of their senior year. So rereading that paragraph, what is sort of unusual about um, the ways in which it's written? Instead of ending the sentence, it, there's, there's commas and semicolons. And it, so instead of just like, it's a long run out sentence and it kind of shows that her thinking, it's erratic and irrational. So she's like, she, her mind is racing and she can't really have a straight thought. So she keeps thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. It's almost like the author is um, writing as she's thinking. So she's like, like, at the end, she says, mind you, she wasn't expecting to, to find anything. Like, she's almost reminding herself that nothing, or she's not supposed to know that her husband is dead on the floor when she gets home. We've taken a complex paragraph, uh, one that transitions from, uh, like, long run-on sentences, and then suddenly goes to short sentences with lots of periods. Um, and we've connected that to a larger point about this character. At first, she seems frantic, erratic, thinking this way, and then she calms herself down, or reminds herself to sort of be reasonable, and reminds herself more rationally of what she's doing. Uh, so the broad point here is that when we're thinking about the author's purpose, like the author is really consciously using things like how he writes sentences to make a broader point. I'd like you to identify one of these places, either from something that we've talked about in this class, uh, or something that you'd notice on your own. Uh, what is one point that the author does something in particular with his style, uh, the way he writes his sentences, um, to make a point about the characters in this story? The way that Common Core is pushing us to teach really does return to uh, what I imagine English education should be in the United States. I, I do think that that kind of push uh, really does create the kind of high-level thinking that we want all students to take part in.